Hello and welcome to this episode of Kennedy Saves the World. Um, today I'm talking with one of my very favorite climate scientists who is, uh, he is a, I guess, rational skeptic. I don't know how he describes himself. That's how I describe him because uh, I read his incredible articles and books and I think to myself, that is how we should be looking at global climate change. Bjorn Lomborg is here. You are um, working with the Hoover Institution. Yep. You're the president of Copenhagen Consensus. Yep. And you're also a decorated New York Times bestselling author. I am. And um, one of the few people who's really rationally tackling climate change. Your most recent article in the New York Post was so great uh, because you touched on two things that scare the bejesus out of people. Mm. One is disappearing polar bears, which, you know, RIP polar bears are all gone, apparently, according to an inconvenient wow. truth. They yeah. can't, there's no way they could possibly be living. And uh, coral reef. Yeah. So how did polar bears become the scare animal of the climate change movement? Well, so there's been a lot of different stories uh, coming around. And polar bears were obviously one of the big ones in the early 2000s. Mm. Uh, Al Gore, as you mentioned, uh, put them in this movie. We were told that, the, you know, they were just going to be gone. Uh, but the reality, of course, is that when you have the data, and we do have the data for how many there are, there's actually more than there's ever been, or we don't know, but, you know, certainly since the since 1960s. Since we've been recording yes, the yes. number of polar bears, yeah. because so, before it was so cold, no one wanted to go up and count them. <laughs> but now but, it's like, Mass, we have to. Like, how and, else are we going to scare yeah. people? In the, uh, in the 1960s, we probably had, you know, around 12,000 or thereabouts mm -hmm. uh, individuals. Now we have 26,000 polar bears. So we've more I'm than doubled I'm not a mathematician. Them. I was <laughs> just going to say, but that that's, sounds, that's more than doubled. That sounds like more than uh, 12,000, yeah. So, the, you know, the fundamental point here is you need to recognize the real data. And that's mm. the point that I try. I should just say, I'm not a climate scientist. I try to uh, look at the climate economics and try to get a sense of what should we be thinking about mm -hmm. when we talk about climate. I take most of the climate a lot scientists. Of science. Yes, I do. And I take the climate scientists at their word when they say there's a problem with climate change but then we need to ask so what should we do about it and one of the things we're told is everything is worse mm -hmm. because of climate change and polar bears is one of those examples no it's not there's a reason why we have more polar bears mm. it's because we stopped shooting them uh you know back in the 1960s everyone shot them all the time uh, which, if you're close to a polar bear, might not be such a bad idea. But, you know, fundamentally, we've stopped shooting most of the polar bears. And that's why they've come back. This is a success okay, story of uh, conservation. We should be incredibly proud of there, it. There are so many ways where human beings are actually pretty good at listening. And human beings want a better life. Yeah. And they want to find solutions to things. Because um, this idea that this is how things are now... And if we continue on this trajectory, then things are going to be awful and we will reach the point of no return. But there's no accounting for the fact that human beings are smart mm. and human beings are also adaptive. Yeah. And we will find ways of adapting to things so they don't so we don't just sit there apathetically until everything is destroyed. But that's the assumption, and it's a pretty negative assumption by it's, climate It's a totally un, un, unrealistic assumption, but it gives great scare stories, right? I mean, perhaps the biggest sort of scare story that you have is the idea that sea levels are going to rise, so a lot of people are going to drown. <laughs> no. Yeah, people that's... in Bakersfield, California <laughs> will have oceanfront property. <laughs> That's the kind of argument. But of course, that's not actually what's going to happen. We do know that sea levels will rise. So it is a problem from climate change. But we also know how to fix this. I mean, Holland is a great example of how to fix sea levels rising and still keep your uh, land intact. 40% uh, of Holland what is below, uh, below uh, surface, uh, the sea, sea level. Uh, they basically put up dikes and water management. Mm -hmm. It's fairly simple and it's very, very cheap. The Dutch have spent uh, over the last 60 years about 10 billion dollars in total on their total protection yeah it's not nothing but you know out of a rich country it's what one percent or so uh of their gdp I, I feel like the french spent that on the Seine for the olympics and, <laughs> yes, and that's, still that's probably true yeah, still yeah. didn't get it right like they, still they, didn't get they right. yeah. spent so much money trying to clean up the river and they they should have just gone to the dutch yes well any, anyway so what that shows you is you know people will tell you a lot of people are going to get flooded because of sea level rise no because we'll adapt Yes, it still has a cost, 
but it's nowhere near the scare stories that you hear. And that's the point that I try to make with this article on the, uh, on the polar bears and also mm. on the uh, coral reef, as you mentioned. You know, we hear constantly that the Great Barrier <coughs> Great Great Reef is, you'll, you'll is never, dead. If you haven't visited now, and I remember late. hearing this yes. in, uh, in 2000, like I, I was making a trip to Australia and I, I wasn't going to the Great Barrier Reef, but people were like, well, if you don't go now, you're never going to see it because it's yeah. dying. Yeah. And then um, when my girls were young in 2012, uh, we went to the Burger Zoo in the Netherlands, the Royal Burger Zoo, which is an amazing place. Like I've never seen, I'm, I'm glad the Dutch are getting like a big shout out here on the podcast, um, but I've never seen anything like this in the US. And I'm not one of those people like, they do everything better in Europe and they have trains. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't believe that. I think every place has, has their own cool things, but this zoo was amazing. And one of the things that really struck me is they were undergoing this massive coral reef research project where they were like, don't tell anyone, but we are finding a way to grow endangered coral. You know, here, yes, in a controlled environment, but also don't tell anyone this, we're able to introduce it into the wild. And so I was thinking like, well, won't that save the Great Barrier Reef? Like, isn't it kind of like cancer research where it starts with a few biologics and then all of a sudden we're using our own immune systems to create medicine that that help us fight the cancers that we have developed? Like, isn't it like that? The more people who come online with this, aren't we going to solve more and more problems? We, but we, yeah, we why, certainly are. Yeah. But why don't we get the high five? I mean, you point yeah. out that the, the reef is better than ever. Yeah. It, it didn't die. Yeah. And it's actually growing. Why don't we hear that? Yes. I mean, first of all, we're a very inventive species, as you just pointed out. We know how to fix a lot of things, and that should definitely be called out. But it's not what's happened in the, uh, in the Great Barrier Reef. They've simply started, you know, they've, uh, since 1986, they've been doing studies every year on how much coral cover is there on the reef. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in uh, uh, 2012, when you visited that, uh, um, that zoo in, uh, in Holland, it was actually at its very lowest point, and people were writing the obituary for the, uh, for the Great Barrier Reef, and you know, people were just basically saying it's over. And now, for the last three years, we have never had more coral reef this year was the absolute maximum we've ever seen. Why? Uh, we don't know. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where you say, wow, it's actually incredibly good, contrary to what you've heard. And, and again, my concern is that we hear every time it's bad. So we heard a lot about it back in 2012. And now we hear almost nothing because, you know, this doesn't fit the narrative. Well, clearly we have to be uh, uh, here as well the coral reef, Great Barrier Reef, is actually better than it's ever been. This does not mean that there's no problem. I mean, I'm glad there are those people still doing the research, but we need to know that things are not nearly as dire as you think. That's a hopeful message, and it's quite frankly someone uh, a message that everybody ought to hear. Yeah, and, and one of the problems with the hysteria is, you know, you have these, these little pet projects where people are so negative and they're scolds. Like, you've done yeah. this. You're human. You use plastic water bottles and deodorant. Like, you are the reason the earth is dying. Yeah. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way because at some point, the hysteria wears off. And, you know, yeah. it's like your your mom, you know, she tells you, well, if, you know, if you you're going to go blind. And it's like, that that might work when you're young, but by but the time you're 18, 19, you're you like... You realize, oh, that didn't yeah, happen. Yeah, but that's no. what's going to happen with human beings. Like yes. We're going to be told the sea levels are rising, uh, extreme heat, as you point out in the article, mm. it's killing us, people can't live in the heat, and at, at some point we're all going to shrug, but yep. in the worst way, and be like, you were lying to us all along, everything is fine, yes. when everything is not fine, yep. but there has to be a better, more positive way of doing it. Well, but, you know, fundamentally telling the truth is probably a good idea. Uh, first of all, uh, you're absolutely right. The scare will eventually uh, uh, wear off, although it hasn't quite yet, right? It seems like they've just amped up the scare even more. Uh, so certainly it's been happening for, what, 20 years or so. Uh, the second part is, when you're scared, you don't make good decisions. It's not like we're great we're, point. we're we're brilliant strategists when uh, when we're scared witless. We'll just try to do something, and that's of course what we've done for the last twenty years. We've done really really ineffective climate policies that are hugely costly, but actually don't do very much. And so 
reality is we should recognize this is a long-term problem. This is, you know, sort of a 21st century problem. We should fix it on a 21st century scale. Yes. And we're not thinking that way at all. The way we fix climate change is mm -hmm. not by telling everyone, I'm sorry, could you be a little colder, a little less comfortable and all that stuff? That's not going to work. I mean, but that's what they're doing in Europe. That's, that's, like the, the oh Paris God, Olympics yeah. was the, the <clears throat> best example of that. You've got world-class athletes. You're forcing them to eat vegan yes. when they need protein yeah. before, you know, before they compete. And they also need to be comfortable so they're yeah. not up all night sweating and yeah. sleep deprived. Sleeping outside. And, and yeah. depleted of <laughs> electrolytes. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and so it's like AC is bad, yes. deodorant is bad, ice yes. is yes. bad. And it's like maybe if you if you stop lecturing us and maybe if you go, hey, here's this really cool stuff. And this is yes. what happens when we innovate. And maybe you use a little bit less of this or maybe we have a shift and we don't use the same materials we have been for 50 years. Hmm. You know, maybe there are new compounds we can use uh, which don't leave, you know, plastic particles in your bloodstream and lymph nodes. Like maybe there are things you can do to actually live longer and yeah. better. And then people start to go, oh, well, I like the idea of yeah. living a longer, better life. Like that sounds like so much more fun than you wrecked everything and we can't have anything nice. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to make you feel guilty and I hope you're miserable. And it's like, well, I kind of am. But, but it's not solving the problem. Don't go anywhere. More Kennedy saves the world right after this. And, and here's one example. So the state of California is suing Exxon for making plastic. Because California's like, well, now we have all this plastic. But California has had horrible policies that haven't done anything that have cost lots and lots of money in terms of their recycling. So why aren't they blaming themselves? Yeah, well, because that would cost them money, right? Yes. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of blame casting. And, and at the end of the day, you're not going to succeed making people feel miserable. You're only going to succeed by making sure you get better technologies. And that was what you were just pointing out. And so what we need to do is invest a lot more in green energy R&D mm -hmm. because that's what's going to get us to a point where we can have air conditioning. We can have What protein. about nuclear? I mean, doesn't yeah, that power cities cheaply? Nuclear is a great opportunity, but the Thorium problem right, nuclear energy. Well, <laughs> the problem is right now that third generation, the current generation of, of nuclear power plants are incredibly expensive. Yes. Uh, one reason is that we vastly overregulated them, but it's really hard to sort of walk that back. And that's why we have such hope for fourth generation nuclear. Is, that, could, is that what Bill Gates is investing in? Like this, it's, these minor, yes, these, these small modular, smaller, yeah, reactors. modular nuclear yes. technology. Yes. That, yes. The, the idea is that you basically uh, make a lot of them on a uh, essentially on, uh, on a serial production just like Ford did with the uh, uh, with the first cars and then you just get a serial uh, recognition of it and then you can just sell all of them and they, you can just put them up anywhere that could be fantastic now we don't know whether it will work but it's that's the idea and it's those kinds of solutions that are going to fix uh, the the world that's going to both fix climate change and get us cheap green energy I don't know whether fourth generation nuclear is going to work we mm -hmm. you know we know like, that it, isn't in it worth a try? Though, absolutely. And we should be focusing on a hydrogen? lot of those uh, solutions. Well, hydrogen is one of those things that everybody loves to talk about, but it doesn't seem like it's going to work anytime soon. Mm. It's just an incredibly expensive way to uh, to essentially save energy, uh, you know, store energy. Uh, my, my reading of it is that it's not going to work at least till 2050 or something. So what is something that we're just starting to think about that has tremendous upside that people aren't talking about yet. And, you know, this is where your forward-looking optimistic approach, I think, is most helpful. Mm. So so I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say <laughs> this is the thing that will really work. Uh, I think we should be researching a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very unlikely that you and I or anyone else have a good idea of what's going to power the rest of the 21st century. But I'll give you one example, and it's just because it's a good story. Uh, Craig Venter, the guy who cracked the human genome back in 2000, mm -hmm. he has this idea of growing uh, genetically modified algae out on the ocean surface. Ooh. And these uh, algae would basically soak up sunlight and CO2 and produce oil. So we could all grow our own Saudi Arabias out in the ocean surface. Then we would harvest the whole thing. We'd keep our entire fossil fuel infrastructure and it'd be CO2 neutral because they just soaked up the CO2 out in the ocean surface a couple of months ago. So this is a way that we could basically have everything we want with no CO2. Now, right now we can do it, but it's not cost effective at mm -hmm. all. But this is one of these many, many ideas 
where we just really need one or a few of them to come through. And then that'll power the 21st century. I know. I mean, they, they say all the above, drill, baby, drill, which, you know, I tend to agree with because we have to use what we have right now yeah. and we have to have a rational agreement that we are going to work to make it better. That the status quo isn't good enough, no. but neither is the fear mongering. No, and, and, and I, I think you're absolutely right. Now is the time to rely on, you know, the our version of the industrial revolution, yeah. which that's what will save us. Like exactly. if you're if you're talking so look, about things that will really save the world. Look, energy is incredibly good for everyone. That's why we you know, there are no low energy rich nations. Rich nations use lots of energy, mm -hmm. and that's great. We have that. There's a lot of people out there in the world who still don't have it. And also, remember, there's a lot of poor people in America that still have way too little energy and that want more energy, that want to you know, be able to get, keep cool in the winter, that kind of thing. Those are simple things where we should make sure we have enough energy right now. And that is, as you point out, to a very large extent, going to be fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. We should definitely make sure we don't make fossil fuels too expensive right now because that's terrible for people all over the world. Then we should also be investing in Especially, green energy research so that in the future, everyone will have lots of energy and without the CO2. Yeah, and, and so the ramp is shorter for people who need the energy most yeah. because, you know, right now the ramp is impossible. Like we are creating these arbitrary timelines that we're never going to meet, but you're, you're sacrificing so much of your GDP in order to get to this utopia. And so what does that do? That sets everyone back, but especially, and this is my problem with statism is the people who need it most are the ones who are helped the least. And they're also the ones who were helped last and i think yeah. that is incredibly immoral but you know if if you have freedom and if you have innovation and if you have people who are not demonized for using their resources for good being led by science then it is our moral obligation to encourage them to do so um last question for you i love snowboarding i love the winter i grew up in oregon i love the rain blah 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 but i also really like beach vacations would it be the worst thing in the world if everything was a little bit warmer? So uh, a little bit warmer world will be slightly more problem problematic on average. But obviously, you just pointed out there'll be some negatives and there'll be some positives. Overall, there'll be slightly more negatives than positives. That's why global warming is a problem. No, it's not the end of the world. Uh, the best studies show that by the end of the century, climate change pretty much unmitigated climate change will feel like we'll be somewhere between two, three percent less well off than we otherwise would be. Mm -hmm. Remember, we'll be, you know, two, three, four times richer by then. So it'll be a tiny fraction less, much, much better by the end of the century. That's not the end of the world. It's a problem. And that's why we need to fix this as a problem and not throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. Or throw the baby out with the bathwater, exactly, which yes. is what to they mix, to mix metaphors. Yeah, so, yeah. that's what they want to <laughs> yes. do right now. They they yes. want to throw everything out and have this forced austerity. And it's like maybe let civilizations prosper, you yeah. know, and and instead of creating unintended consequences. Oh, of, of course, and and also what you have to realize is maybe you'll get Americans and Europeans along but you won't get Chinese, Indians, and Africans along. And those are the people who are really going to matter for the rest of the, uh, of the 21st century. So, you know, we need to find technologies that actually make you richer and cut emissions rather than make you a lot poorer and cut emissions. Um, I know a lot of climate scientists and those who study it, there are things that keep them up at night. What allows you to sleep at night? So fundamentally, that we are a very, very smart civilization. There is nothing that we have seen in the past that indicates that even significant changes in climate are going to suddenly make the world catastrophically worse off. It is going to be a problem, yes, but there are lots of problems in the 21st century. And it's just simply, I think, almost irresponsible and certainly immoral to scare kids and people witless about climate change mm. when the real challenge for most people around the world is the fact that their kids are dying from easily curable infectious diseases. They don't have enough food. They don't have good education. There are all these other very, very simple problems in the world. And you know, if you're going to worry about stuff, maybe that's what you should worry about first. And again, these are also things we know how to fix with smart innovation, with technology, and you know, quite frankly, with money. Yes. It, it reminds me of raising teenagers. Because before they're teenagers, 
you you wring your hands a lot. And you're like, oh my god, what's going to happen when they're teenagers? Like, I'm terrified. So what are you going to do? You're going to let them live their lives and go, <laughs> you know, use your approach? It's like, yeah, there are going to be some problems, and we're going to have to do our best to raise them well. And then when we get to the problems, we're going to find solutions for them. Yeah. Or and- do you just throw them in a nunnery? Just throw them in a convent. <laughs> oh, that might be another that's solution. that's what yeah, we're yeah. doing with the climate right now. We're throwing everyone in the convent with no air conditioning and, uh, you know. And no, and no protein. No, and, and charging them more for the energy they're using yeah. with the renewable energy, which right now is kind of garbage. Fjorn Momborg, always good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been Kennedy Saves the World. He's actually saving the world, and I'm Kennedy. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts and Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app. Oh, go ahead and leave me a review while you're there. I'd love to hear what you have to say. You've been listening to Kennedy Saves the World on the Fox News Podcast Network.